Hello, I'm Lynn Boddy, a fungal ecologist from Cardiff University, and I'm going to talk about fungi, a load of rot. Now, I often hear people say, oh, fungi, they're a nuisance. They rot our food, our homes, our belongings. And yes, some of them do do that. But without them, the ecosystems of our planet would not work. We would not be here. Every year, vast quantities of new plant material are made by plants worldwide and similar amounts are broken down again. And this is essential because not only would we be up to our armpits in dead stuff if it wasn't for the, the decomposers, but also the nutrients locked up within that dead stuff would not be available to plants. By breaking down all the, the dead organic matter, nutrients are released to enable plants to grow and let our ecosystems flourish. Now, there are a whole range of different organisms important as decomposers to break down this dead material. They range from tiny bacteria through to quite large invertebrates. And they also include small invertebrates, such as the nematodes you can see wriggling around here. And the major agents of decomposition are the fungi. One of them is illustrated here, the fly agaric. That's perhaps not the best example I could have chosen. It does do some decomposition, but its main job is in feeding plant roots in an association called mycorrhiza. But back to the decomposers. So is it mushrooms that break down dead tissues? Well, not exactly. Mushrooms are fruit bodies, they're equivalent to the flowers or fruits of flowering plants. They release spores, which you can see being blown around. Um, these spores are equivalent to the seeds of flowering plants. And this is one of the main ways that fungi spread. These spores come in all shapes and sizes and colors and ornamentations. When a spore lands and the conditions are just right, it will germinate. A fine filament grows out. This is called a hypha. The filament branches, branches some more, initially in a higgledy-piggledy pattern and, they, and later on in a more symmetrical sort of way. Fungal hyphae grow from their tips. Here they are growing microscopically. I'm sorry that this is a juddery image. It's because this is being filmed. Growing through whatever it is that they're feeding upon. You can see side branches growing up to fill spaces. They are foraging for nutrients. The first images I showed were microscopic and indeed hyphae are microscopic but when there are masses of them, we can see them with the naked eye. And here they are growing across a surface. So individual hyphae are very tiny. We cannot see them without the aid of a microscope. They often, however, aggregate together to form structures which are vaguely reminiscent of roots, which you can see here. These are called mycelial cords, and we can certainly see them but most of the time fungi are acting as individual hyphae. Here are some more examples of fungi which have aggregated together. This is a tray of soil about 24 centimeters across. A block of wood colonized by the fungus has been put on the surface of the soil and the fungus has grown out as individual hyphae which have then aggregated to form these cords and this rather beautiful mycelial network. And here we have a culture of a fungus on an agar plate. And again, you can see it because there are masses of hyphae. Now, fungi are the most important decomposers because their fine filaments can get into solid objects. They do this by secreting enzymes. They make a vast array of enzymes and some of these enzymes can break down the most complicated molecules in nature, such as lignin. In fact, if we take kingdom fungi as a whole, they can break down all of the complicated organic compounds thrown at them. They can break down simple sugars and all sorts of other materials. This is a fungus growing on dung, fungi decay leaves and the petioles of leaves, horn, um, keratin, chitin, wood. 
fungi feed by what is called external digestion. The hyphae secrete enzymes which break down big molecules in the food to small molecules, small enough that they can be absorbed into the hyphae for the hyphae to grow. Now I'm going to concentrate on decay of wood because wood is perhaps the most complicated organic compound that is produced and it's only really fungi which can break down wood at any reasonable sort of rate. There are several different types of rot and one of the most common is called white rot and that's because when the fungi grow in the wood they break down all of the chemicals including things like cellulose, hemicellulose and the complicated lignin and this leaves the wood a bleached colour. Eventually all of that wood will be completely decomposed, broken down just to its constituent parts, carbon dioxide and water and releasing the mineral nutrients that were inside. Now I'll try to explain to you how white rot occurs. Now this is a representation of a wood cell wall. Wood is made up with lots and lots of cells with thick walls, so this is the, the wall of the cell, and these cells are hollow, so this is the lumen, the hollow inside the cell, because these cells in, in living trees um, conduct water uh, from the roots up to the shoots through the hollow tubes. Now the hyphae of the white rot fungi lie in these cells on the wall, so they're in the lumen here, on the wall they secrete enzymes around the hypha and these enzymes gradually erode the wall away and with time the whole of the wall will be completely eroded away until nothing is left. Here we can see the early stages of decay and here some later stages of decay. Now another main type is called brown rot and you can see why this is. The wood is brown, it's cubic, cubically cracked and crumbly and the fungi which do this type of decay they can use the cellulose and hemicellulose just like white rot fungi but they are unable to break down the lignin and hence the wood remains a brown colour due to the lignin that is left. Now again, the hyphae lie on the wood cell wall in, in the cell cavity in the lumen, but this time they make tiny molecules which can diffuse into the wood, woody wall and they produce something called free radicals which bomb around, breaking up the cellulose and hemicellulose molecules into small molecules which can then diffuse to the hyphae. And so this is why we get this rather different structure. Not all of the wall is broken down, the lignin remains. Now white rot fungi are far more common than brown rot fungi. There are a few examples shown here. Nonetheless, there are quite a lot of brown rot fungi around. Um, many of the fungi which rot conifer trees are brown rotters. The ones we hear, see here are the beefsteak fungus, which is very common on oak and sweet chestnut. And uh, the chicken of the woods, later porous sulfurious, which we find again on oak and yew and, and beech, for example. There is another type of, type of rot called soft rot. Uh, and this occurs rather more slowly and less extensively. Again, the hyphae lie on the cell wall in the lumen, but this time they produce a very, very fine penetration peg, about 0.5 micrometers in diameter, the sort of size of bacteria are, in, actually goes into the woody cell wall and then makes these diamond shaped cavities. And uh, let me explain how this happens. If you imagine this is the, the wood cell wall, this is the cell lumen, there is the hypha that's just lying on the wall. It produces this fine penetration peg into the wood cell wall. That then branches into a T-shaped and around the, the tips of the T, enzymes are produced and a diamond shaped cavity is formed. The hyphae then grow out some more and the process continues making a chain of cavities within the wood cell wall. And you can see these here, they're spiraling around the wood cell wall. And they do this because they are using the cellulose and hemicellulose in the wood cell wall and the cellulose microfibrils actually spiral around and that's why you see this pattern of cavities. 
Uh, you can see this is a, a, these are microscopic images, obviously. This is a, a cross section through, and you can see the holes that have been made here. This is in longitudinal section, so you can see the, the cavities. And in this particular instance here, they're near the, uh, near the lumen, and they've actually coalesced, and it looks a little bit like um, white rot there. Um, ascomycetes tend typically to be the, the fungi which produce this type of decay. So, for example, Cretinaria, Deosta, Viscognioxia, Numularia, Xyleria, Hypoxylon, the candle snuff fungus. And actually, there are Basidiomycetes which can do soft rot too. This fungus, Meripolis giganteus, uh, could do soft rot, but also it is a white rotter, so it can do two types of decay sometimes in the same piece of wood in slightly different places. Now, of course, white rotters that can break down every single component could, a single individual could break down a whole piece of wood without any other fungi present. But this rarely happens. Fungi rarely exist alone. And when they meet, they fight. You can see this here on a tray of soil. This fungus, Phanerocheti velutina, was growing in this piece of wood, which we put on, on the surface of the soil. This one contained Hyphaloma fasciculari. The fungi grew out and they met about here. But you can see that Phanerocheti is pushing back Hyphaloma fasciculari, the sulfur tuft fungus. These are battles. We can see these battles occurring in wood. When you cut through a piece of wood, you often see these very attractive looking lines, they're called interaction zone lines. And this is the boundary of an individual fungus. There's one fungus in there, another one in there, another one in there, and so on and so on. And it's a little bit like us, how we put um, fences or hedges or walls around our homes and gardens to demarcate our territory. Uh, these fungi are interacting with each other here. And the battle is, is evenly matched. So in, in this case, neither fungus makes any headway and they maintain their own territory. But sometimes one fungus is a better fighter than another and it replaces its opponent and takes over its territory. And fungi have different modes of attack and defense. Some can fight, they are antagonistic at a distance. And we can see this, this here on this agar uh, plate with two fungi fighting, you can see that actually they don't make contact, but they're certainly inhibiting each other. And they do this by producing chemicals which diffuse through the medium that the fungus is growing in. And they also produce volatile compounds in the air. Another type uh, of attack is called hyphal interference. This hypha has made contact with this fungus. This is Flebia gigantea. This is Heterobasidionanosum. Flebia has killed the, the, the compartment, the cell that it is contacted. And if there are enough of these contacts, then the whole of, of the opponent fungus can be killed. And this is the basis of the biological control that is used to uh, control Heterobasidion anosum and conifer, conifer plantations. Another form of attack is mycoparasitism. One fungus will coil around the other. Sometimes it penetrates inside and uses that fungus for food. And then there's the example that I've shown already, which we quite often call gross mycelial contact um, because it's happening on a big scale. There are lots of different mechanisms involved, I'm absolutely sure, but we don't understand them well enough yet to be able to, to use different uh, descriptors. Now we can actually measure some of these chemicals which are being produced by fungi during these battles. So for example, we might grow them on Petri dishes, um, but, but usually we do our experiments in wood because of course that's much closer to the real world than agar jelly. And we can interact our fungi, like you can see here. Uh, this is the fungus Resinicium bicolor in this wood block. This is the sulfur tuff fungus, Hyphaloma fasciculari. And we might allow them to interact and open the lid and um, allow the gases uh, to accumulate in a, in a bag. We can then capture those glasses with, with a, 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 a tube and inject them into a machine called a GCMS, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And this separates out the different chemicals in the gases that were here, in the volatile compounds that the fungus has produced, because this really is a bit like um, the, the gas warfare in, in, in the 
in the trenches of the First World War. It's not the same gases that they produce, obviously. There's all sorts of different um, chemicals, some of which are very harmful to fungi, not necessarily to anybody else. Okay, now, if the fungus is growing on its own, this is, this is a trace that we can see. You can see this is hyphaloma, and there are three peaks. It's producing, when it's growing on its own, three different volatiles. Now, we know that fungi produce volatiles, and, and you know about this yourselves, because the smell that mushrooms produce, when we smell mushrooms, we think, oh, those are mushrooms. Those are volatiles. Now, they're not harmful chemicals, obviously, but they are volatiles. They're chemicals in the air. So we know that fungi produce volatiles when they're growing on their own. There are three here. This fungus resinitin perhaps produces something there. But look at all the chemicals that are produced when the two fungi, hyphaloma versus resinitium, are fighting. Now certainly some of those volatile chemicals are harmful to the opponent. Here are some more examples of fungi fighting, again on agar petri dishes. This fungus here is fighting this one. You can see that it's, it's completely grown over and indeed through, and it's almost completely destroyed this fungus. There's another one here. This is the sulfur tough fungus, again, fighting resinitium. It's got this far. This is an interesting example. This fungus is starting to grow over this other one and probably killing it with these mycelial cords. But on the other hand, the opponent is actually managing to take some of this fungus's territory starting to happen there too. In these uh, four examples, the colour that you can see actually is a dye which indicates where enzymes are being produced. In the case of the purple one, it's the enzyme um, lacase. And here, on a much more localised scale, you can see this purple colour indicates peroxidase enzymes. Now, fungal battles are a bit like a sports league. You know that, for example, in the football league, there are football teams that are at the top of the table, teams usually like Manchester United and Liverpool, which tend to beat most of the other teams most of the time, these, these teams at the bottom of the table. Uh, the examples I've given you here are some of the important fungi which break down beech wood. So Hyphaloma and Phanerochetia are, are great fighters, then the candle snuff fungus and the honey fungus on Monera gallica are really rather poor. But just like in sports leagues, sometimes you get a giant killer which perhaps will, will manage to, to beat one of the, the, one of the top players just on a very rare occasion. And actually, these battles vary, the outcome of these battles vary depending upon the environment. So here we have Flebia radiata, which is Flebia radiata, which is doing very well at 20 degrees C, but elevate that temperature by five degrees to 25 degrees C, and you can see that the tables have been turned. The sulfur tough fungus Hyphaloma fasciculari has grown completely over and is actually replacing Flebia radiata beneath it. Here we have turkey tail Trametes vesicolor against King Alfred cake Daldinia concentrica. You can see Trametes is beginning to replace the Daldinia. And in a week or so's time, a couple of weeks' time, the Trametes would have grown completely across this plate. However, if you change the water potential, water potential tells you how easy or how hard it is to get water from the medium. So make, make it harder for a fungus to get water, then the tables are turned and Daldinia beats Trametes. Make it even harder to get water, uh, and Trametes doesn't stand a chance. There are other things which can alter the outcomes as well. For example, if invertebrates are feeding on the fungus, or if other microbes are present like bacteria, or indeed other fungi. So very many situations can affect the outcome of interactions. Now, actually, from a human perspective, we have a huge benefit from some of these compounds that fungi produce to protect themselves. And penicillin, the wonder drug of our age, is produced by the fungus penicillium. It, it produces antibiotics which kill bacteria. And we've made great use of this and indeed other antibiotics produced by fungi too. And indeed, actually, fungi can produce quite a lot of different medicines. One more example, and there are many examples. Uh, here is an example, statins, which control the, the level of cholesterol. 
And I've mentioned, of course, that fungi do their decay and their rotting by producing enzymes. And we harness some of these too. We cultivate the fungi in vast vats and, and get the enzymes which they produce. So, for example, some produce amylases, which break down starch, invitase, which is used to make the soft centers in chocolate, and pectic enzymes, which break down cell walls of plants and allow us to get more fruit juice out of fruit, proteases, which tenderize meat, and rennet, the enzyme which is used to make cheese. In the past, it was obtained from animals, but now it's obtained from fungi. Fungi also make all sorts of chemicals, and I've illustrated three which are used by man. Um, itoconic acid is used in paints, gluconic acid in toothpaste, citric acid is used in all um, canned soft drinks um, to stabilise the acidity, and it's used in canned fruit and vegetables to prevent the loss of vitamin C. And of course, chemicals the fungi can break down. Uh, 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 there are huge. There's a huge amount of them. Um, for example, plastics. There are some fungi which can degrade plastics, and indeed other pollutants too. And I'm sure that in the future we will be able to harness these to break down the chemicals with which we are polluting our planet. But let's let us let us turn turn back from man. We know that that, that fungi can be used. As food for man, the decomposer fungi can be used as food for man or to make man's food, such as bread and wine and cheeses. But invertebrates are also dependent upon fungi very often. Over millions and millions of years, they have evolved partnerships with fungi. These are, these are wood wasps that you can see here. And wood wasps lay their eggs in wood. There you can see the, the, the ovipositor tube which lays its, through which the wood wasp lays its eggs. And at the same time, it injects a fungus, a fungus called a mylosterium, into the wood. This is a wood decay fungus. And it starts to break down the wood and softens the wood and improves its nutritional quality so that the wood wasp's larvae can burrow into the wood. Um, there are lots of other examples of this, the bark beetles and ambrosia beetles, they often bring their own fungus with them, um, sometimes in special tubes or chambers, sometimes just on their bodies. And here we can see another example of this mutualism, this partnership between fungi and invertebrates. These are termites and the higher termites in the macrotermitini, they cultivate fungi in, in their nests, in soil. They bring food to the fungus and the fungus breaks that food down. Now the termites themselves, these higher termites, are unable to break down um, complicated molecules, but the fungi can. And so then the termites can feed on the fungi. So the fungus benefits because food is brought to it. The termites benefit because they can eat the fungus. And the Atine ants in South America have similar relationships too. Carrying on this theme about the importance of fungi for invertebrates and also for invertebrates, we all know that there are lots of hollow trees about. In fact, unfortunately, the number of hollow trees are declining. Our, our, we don't have so many big trees now. Now, the hollows in trees are made by fungi. And sometimes people think, oh, this is a bad thing. This is a hollow tree. It's, it's not going to be safe. This is, this is terrible. The fungus is hollow in it. But no, in fact, it's a very important thing because many organisms are dependent on those hollow trees. There are a thousand species of vertebrates, so mammals and birds worldwide, which depend on the hollows of trees made by fungi. In the UK alone, there are 1700 invertebrate species which depend on rotting wood for habitat. So just to sum up then how I began, without fungi, the ecosystems of our planet would not function. So we would not be here. Rotters are important beyond all belief. So on that note, I'd like to thank the fungi and indeed all of the supporting players
who provided me with illustrations for this talk. And thank you for listening. Oh, fantastic. What a wonderful talk. I'm just going to ask Lynn to unmute, and which she has. Um, so uh, I'm sure everyone's got lots of questions. Um, if you could type them into the chat and we'll go about it that way and that should keep it a little bit more ordered. Um, one of the questions in the chat is from Sunit, who asks, amongst fungus and moulds, which one is more stronger? Uh, well, uh, I think it, it, it all depends on context and who is fighting whom, really. Um, in the real world, the wood decay fungi usually predominate. In saying that, um, moulds, you think of trichoderma as being a mould, um, that's my, my, mycoparasitic, uh, so, so that can um, kill fungi. In fact, we have a terrible trouble with uh, trichoderma if it gets into the lab it's, it's just a nightmare it, it, will, it will run through and, and just dis destroy your experiment so we, we've lost whole experiments with you know thousands and thousands of the, these pairs of wood blocks imagine my hands are, are the wood blocks pairing them up um, so 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 the, so the wood the wood decay is the basidiomyces are usually overall the, stro the strongest I guess in these battles but within the wood decay fungi as I said there's a huge spectrum of abilities Hopefully that answers your question. Fantastic. And I'm just going to, um, I, I, sh I should say that um, Lynn, uh, Professor Lynn Body, has had a journey to get here today. From what I've heard, there, there's been power cuts and all, no all, all number of barriers. But despite it all, she, um, it has, she has made it here. And oh, we've, got some, we've got some questions coming. So that, that's great. But um, it is a real great time, a uh, really great event to end UK Fungus Day on. So I'm, I'm excited and I'm going to jump to a question. Uh, could fungi one day be used to biodegrade structures like buildings, etc.? And that's from David. Well, um, I, I guess that, as I said in the talk, I think that, that take the kingdom fungi as a whole, they can, they can break down all naturally made compounds. Um, orga organic compounds. So it depends really what your building is made of, I guess. But in saying that, we know, of course, that, that, that fungi can get into rocks. I mean, that's how soils are started to form by getting into rocks. Um, and sometimes fungi can be a bit of a nuisance on um, sculptures, statues, and that sort of thing. Uh, we know that fungi can, there are some fungi which can break down plastics. Um, and so any of these sort of man-made organic materials, I guess, ultimately they will evolve to cope with. Um, iron and steel are perhaps a different, a different matter. So you can't imagine that a whole building would necessarily be broken down by a fungus, but you could, you could, you could um, if, if, if the buildings were made with natural materials, then certainly yes. Fantastic. And perhaps following that one, Lenka asks, what would happen if rotters were not there? Would all plants have animals just not decompose? This is a question actually that I, that, I, that I used to like to set in exams really, if it were not for, for fungi, you know, would, 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 would there be no decomposition? Um, they, they, they are the main agents of decomposition, um, but other organisms are involved too, as I mentioned, invertebrates and bacteria and, and the like, and some bacteria can actually break down wood, but they do so very, very, very slowly. Uh, so basically, there are other organisms which could break down materials, but they wouldn't be able to do it sufficiently quickly, um, presumably, to release nutrients so that plants could continue to grow. I mean, there are other ways of breaking down materials as well, like fire, for example, and that is a natural phenomenon uh, for releasing nutrients. But it really is the fungi which uh, break down and release nutrients at a reasonable rate so that the ecosystems of our planet can function. 
So we'd have we'd have major problems if 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 somehow you you stopped all decomposer fungi from from working tomorrow with, within ten years our ecosystems would stop functioning. I would imagine as a sort of a, a back of an envelope calculation. I mean, so we we have um, Cameron, our our wonderful quiz master from Friday. He asks the black lines that form in woods spalting are they hyphae? They're very tough. Yeah. Okay. That's a good. That's a good question. Yeah. So they are made. They are made from hyphae. They are. They're, they're, they're within plant tissue. They're, they're within the in the woody tissue as well. Um, but they're, they're sort of very twisted and warped um, and highly melanized very often. And, and so you do get you get effectively a whole tissue. And, and some of them, like if you think about wood that's rotted by the candle snuff fungus or armillaria, you can actually remove. That the whole plates of these tissues, so our malaria coats itself in, in a pseudosclerotial plate, um, whether there are other fungi present or not. It, so it, it, it makes these plates um, to, to maintain the environment that it wants in, in, the, in the right form. So in the case of our malaria, it likes the wood to be wet. In the case of the candle snuff and the malaria hypoxanon, it likes the wood to be dry. Um, but these the, these uh, these interaction zone lines between other other fungi are perhaps a, a little bit different, but they they do have these these warped hyphae and they do effectively form continuous um, barriers. And, and yes, they are tough. Uh, but uh, if you get a good uh, a good opponent who who can beat the thing next door to it, it, it if it can penetrate through a pseudosclerotial plate, then uh, one of these interaction zone lines, uh, then it can get in and destroy the fungus that's in there. And you can actually see this in, in wood quite often. If, if you cut through a slice of wood, you sometimes see those beautiful lines, which I've showed in some of the, of the pictures today. But also you can find um, relic zone lines where the zone lines themselves have started rotting, rotting away, uh, presumably as the result of whatever fungus has attacked, um, the, has attacked the, the neighbour or whatever, or whoever produced the interaction zone lines. Interestingly, there's often a sort of a no man's land between two decay columns um, where neither of the, of the players on either side of the line are present, uh, but other fungi, uh, mic micro fungi, can eke out an existence just within those one or two wood cells which are between those, uh, between the plates made by each of the opponents. Wonderful. We, I, there's some more general questions which I will come back to, but I think one that follows that wonderfully is from Evelina who asks, in fungal wars, which secondary, secondary metabolites are the weapon or weapons of choice? <laughs> That's a good one. I think that there's a whole host and it varies de de between, between species um, quite considerably. Some of the things that fungi pr produce, um, well, there's, 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 uh, that's, that's just a, a, it's a how long is almost a how long is a piece of string question that is because we know that uh, um, a vast array of different chemicals are produced both volatiles um, and diffusible chemicals we also know that different chemicals are produced depending on which fungus um, fights is, is fighting which other fungus um, so for example you know the rock paper scissors game you where you get well, I can't remember what does what, but if you had species A, species A might beat species B, species B might beat species C, but species C might beat species A. And we think that, that that ability to do that is probably because the fungi produce different chemicals in, in different combinations. Um, as well as attacking chemicals, they produce defensive chemicals. So, so some of the attacking chemicals they produce are, are not necessarily volatile gaseous chemicals. Um, they can be enzymes. Um, lacases and peroxidases, in fact, the sort of things that um, fungi use to, to break down wood. Um, those could be defensive chemicals, they could be attacking chemicals. Um, defensive chemicals are important because if a fungus is throwing nasty compounds at, at, at another one, then it needs to be able to break down those compounds so that it, it is itself not damaged. Um, other changes that occur are um, that uh, the, the, the fungus has to repair um, damaged tissues and the like. So there's a whole host of different things going on. It, it really is not a straightforward situation there. Good question though, good question. Fantastic, we're, we're moving into some ecological questions. Um, 
and apologies on pronunciation here, uh, Zinlap asks, would there be a lot of decomposer fungi in peat bogs? Yes, I just spotted that question whizzing up on, on, on the chat and that, that is a good question. Now, um, for breaking down wood, it's absolutely essential that there is oxygen present. And of course, in peat, back, in peat bogs, um, they're totally water saturated. And so wood decomposition is something that's very hard to ha happen in, in that situation. And we know that because there's not enough oxygen, when you've got high water content, you've, you've got very low oxygen. And we know that that's absolutely true. And it takes a, a huge amount of time for wood to decompose in peat bogs. Um, because uh, in, in Somerset, the Somerset levels area, which, which um, are actually below sea level and, and used to be completely flooded, and there were sort of islands effectively dotted about the Somerset levels. And sort of four or 4,000 or more years ago, um, Neolithic man built sort of trackways between these islands. The trackways were made of wood and they, they pegged down wood at the side and, and sort of had planks, uh, well, not planks, but chunks or whatever across the middle. And um, when these pathways were discovered, the wood looked in many cases to be intact. Now, actually, it, it wasn't intact. It just, it just looked it, it looked it. There had been decomposition uh, and probably about 90% weight loss very often. But remember that, 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 that it had taken 4,000 years to do that. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty slow rate of decay. Um, so decay does occur in peat bogs, but we know that it's very, very slow because that is why the, the peat accumulates because decay is very slow. So one of the worrying things about climate change really is if peat bogs start to dry out, then decay will occur much, much, much more rapidly. And those huge carbon stocks that are locked up in peat bogs would be burnt off effectively to carbon dioxide and water, and so um, that would exacerbate our climate change problem. Wonderful. That, that's that's a fantastic answer. That's, that's wonderful. We have a uh, Nikita uh, Tartarinov uh, asks. I read that when a tree decomposes, one type of mycelium replaces another. Uh, um, it depended on the fact that the mushrooms decompose certain substances and then species decomposes other substances. So yeah, do, 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 when, when a tree decomposes, does one mycelium replace another? Yes, certainly. When a tree, yes, absolutely. So although the white rot fungi, if you had an individual one, it could completely, de if it was left on its own, if it was in the lab, it could completely decompose a whole tree without anything else being there. But I think that that, I, I, that rarely, if ever, happens in the real world. And so you effectively do get a succession of different fungi um, based on their fighting ability. But not only that, um, fighting ability changes as the environment changes. So it changes under different um, weather, if you like. So water content, temperature, the battles change, but also um, how much food is left available, how big a volume a fungus occupies. And so we end up getting a succession uh, of, of different communities in, during um, wood decay. Because remember, wood can take a long time to decay. So we can, we, can, we can look at community change in wood decomposition and, and we get succession in a similar sort of way to, to the successions we get in plant communities. So there is always change. And um, interestingly, the fungus that is there early on can affect which one comes in next. So there's what are called priority effects. And this was noticed uh, first by, by field mycologists saying that, oh, well, look, these fruit bodies always seem to come after these fruit bodies, whatever, of what, whatever species. But of course, there could be lots of reasons for that, such as um, fruit, different fungi fruit who produce their fruit bodies at different times in their life cycle. So some people, some fungi produce uh, fruit bodies very early on, some people, so I don't know why I keep calling people fungi people. That's obviously the way I think of fungi. Some fungi produce fruit bodies later on in, in their lives. So we set out actually to test this idea, does a certain fungus in wood affect what comes after it, basically? And we colonized uh, discs of wood, be beach discs, 
about that sort of size with individual fungi. And we did this for about, I don't know, we used about nine different Cidiomycetes and, and Ascomycetes, put them out in, in the, in, on the forest floor, collected them back at different times, six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, that sort of thing. We looked to see what fungi were there. And in the 24 month samples, or it might've been the year samples, I don't remember offhand, um, but in one of the sets of samples, we actually sequenced all the DNA that was in there. I'm using next generation sequencing to see what fungi came in and whether the, the initial fungus affected what came in later on. And sure enough, it did. So we found that the fungi which replaced xylariaceous ascomycetes were very different from those which replaced um, basidiomycetes. But even amongst basidiomycetes, there were differences. So uh, Asterium hirsutum had very different communities following it from all of the other fungi. So yes, there is there is succession. Great question. Great, great question. Fantastic. Uh, we've got two more questions in more of the ecology, and then we'll jump to the conservation. So the two ecological questions are stitching together. Hannah Scott asks, have you heard of fungi surviving the charcoaling process? How hardy are they? I, I and don't, yeah, I don't know the answer to that one, but carry on with the second part. And Nicole asks, in the fungal wars, if one is winning, does the other go dormant until conditions are better for it to make a comeback, or is it killed off? Okay, right. So I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Hannah. I, I'd really like to talk about ch um, ch charring at some point. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it is an area which I am just just starting um, to get it to get into. Um, with regard to the second question. Sometimes fungi, when they're being attacked, um, will effectively operate an escape mechanism. So attack can often make fungi fruit. And so if they're near to the surface, they may be able to produce fruit bodies so that they can escape as, um, as spores in the hope that the, that, the, that the spore might land somewhere which is suitable. Um, but sometimes they can make survival structures which allow them to survive. So for example, um, when we've done experiments in the lab using our malaria species, and we haven't done, done this recently, I should say, but our malaria actually covers itself in these very thick pseudosclerotial plates and another fungus will come in and just charge straight over the top of it, which hasn't necessarily replaced it. So I think there might be examples of that sometimes occurring in nature. And you, you know our malaria produce, well, some of the our malaria species produce these, these rhizomorphs, these root-like structures, which, which grow, through so, grow through soil to find another tree or whatever. Um, our malaria is not a, good, not a good fighter, but by coating itself in these melanized, thick melanized coats, it, it's a bit like an army tank in that it's, it's going through the battlefield, but ignoring everything else. So these, 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 thick, these thickened structures, um, can get to somewhere else because soil invertebrates don't eat them, bacteria and soil fungi doesn't, whatever they throw at it, doesn't really have much effect. So yes, there is potential for that. Some of them probably produce sclerotia. We know, for example, with plant pathogens that they very often could survive um, by making thick walled sclerotia. I think that in wood, it doesn't happen so very often. Um, but, but certainly that is, a, that is a mechanism that other fungi do employ, making them some thick walled sclerotia, which, which protects them until conditions might improve. Fantastic. To, to shift to the conservation question, Rosie Turner asks, why is it important to conserve fungal biodiversity and how is the best way to do it? Well, I wish I knew the answer to the last part of that question. Um, so the, to the first part of the question, yes, it is important. Um, some people say for conservation in general that, you know, everything has a, a right to exist. And that's probably a bit of a, a trite answer. Um, I think that we need to maintain and preserve fungal diversity because we don't know what conditions there are going to be in the future. Um, and the the more diversity of, of any of these organisms that you've got, 
the better chance there is for, for ecosystems to, to be able to cope with whatever is thrown at them because they all have different sets of characteristics. How do we preserve um, diversity of fungi? I think that's a really, really hard question. Um, there's a mountain movement and a mountain efforts in research on, on fungal conservation, but I think one of, one of the, and there's two aspects really, there's the scientific aspects to conservation, and I suppose there's also the political aspects, and in many ways I think the political aspects are perhaps um, harder to address, so by political aspects I mean how can we, we make people um, think about the organisms around us and, and not destroying them. And, and I really don't know the answer to that. It's harder with many fungi. Um, people want to, to conserve white rhinos and, and cuddly, panda, cuddly pandas and furry animals, but very often they, they're not so interested in fungi because they have this feeling that fungi are bad. And of course, as we know, that is not the case. I mean, there are some charismatic fungi and I suspect everybody on the planet knows Ammonita muscaria probably. Um, and and, and some, some of the more dramatic fungi lion's mane and things like that um which is a which is which is rare in certainly in, in the uk uh, and people could get behind that those took to, to uh, for conservation and certainly people have got very interested in wax caps wax caps are undoubtedly um doing very well because they're charismatic species and people are prepared uh to to try to save land with which is rich in diversity uh, of wax cap uh, fungi. Um, so I don't know the answer to the political side of things. It, it, I guess it's a similar problems with many groups of organisms, but we have worse problems because of this lack of charisma. Um, from a scientific point of view, there are things that we can do because we can potentially reintroduce um, rare and endangered fungi. So turning back to, to, the, to the lion's mane, Hericium coralloides, Hericium erinaceus, which are uh, rare species in, in Britain, we can actually inoculate those very easily into wood. And, and this won't go as any surprise to you because you know how easy it is. You can buy, you can buy off the internet um, packs of spores or spawn to, uh, and inoculate your own um, wood with, with these fungi. And they, and they do take very well. At the moment, we're doing trials as to whether we can inoculate them and re-establish them in standing trees. Now, there is, there is an issue if, if you start reintroducing fungi. It's really important that you reintroduce species that are local to that area. So it's important that we don't say, oh, look, um, such and such a species is common, I don't know, somewhere in Europe or North America. Let's get a culture of that and, and it reintroduce it into Britain. That's a terrible a terribly, terribly dangerous thing to do, which is one reason why I'm, I'm a bit perturbed. I wouldn't want people to start buying off the internet um, species that you can you can home grow and then start inoculating your trees. That'd be a bad thing to do because if we don't know the provenance of, of, of those fungi, um, we, we could be doing far more harm than good. So you have to reintroduce things which, which are local or originally came from that area. So, so there, are, there are things we can do. You can do that with the decomposer fungi not quite so easy with the mycorrhizal fungi is they're, they're harder to, uh, to, to culture at the moment. But there's all sorts of things that we could do given the will um, to keep what we've got to make conditions uh, appropriate for, for, for fungi uh, in the same way as people try to, to uh, conserve um, other sorts of wildlife. Fantastic. We've got we've got a question here that, that two people have asked. Izzy Sharp asks, what are your thoughts on the fungi internet or wood wide web, where supposedly fungi connect trees underground, for example, allowing larger trees to pass nutrients to a sapling? And David says, great question. I would also like to know about that. OK, so to, to me, I mean, people do talk about the wood wide web, and I think it was a, it was a, a great term coined, coined by Sir David Reed quite a number of years ago now to um, to indicate that there were mycorrhizal networks uh, in the forest floor which interconnect trees, as you suggest. I like to think that there are two wood wide webs because there is also there are, there are also decay fungi which can grow out 
Um, most decay fungi stay within, say, wood or leaves or, or, or dung or whatever it is they're rotting, but there are other ones which can grow out and form these networks in the same sort of way as ectomycorrhizal uh, fungi do. So I think, I think that there are several wood wide webs. Now, when you think about the, um, the mycorrhizal wood wide webs connecting one tree with another, please don't think that it's a single fungus or a single species of fungus, which maybe is connecting all of the trees in a particular woodland because usually that is far from the case. What it is, is lots of networks of different fungi connecting groups of trees together. That can be different species and indeed different individuals of uh, the same tree species. So, so there are all sorts of interconnections going on connecting trees within the forest floor. Uh, and this includes connecting sometimes trees of different species. So some mycorrhizal fungi are quite specific to the trees that they colonize. Other ones are less specific and can colonize different tree species. So in that case, if you've got the same individual fungus connecting, say, a, um, a pine with a birch tree, then you can connect different plants together. Now we know that through those networks, water can move. Um, Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus can move these nutrients that the fungi have sequestered from soil. But we also know that sugars can move and these sugars can be, have been made um, during photosynthesis by the tree. So one tree could move sugars to another tree. Um, most likely of more commonly, presumably of the same species of tree, but not necessarily could sometimes be of offspring of a tree. We also know that um, plant roots interconnected by mycorrhizal mycelium can move signals, warning signals from one plant to another. So for example, if one plant is being attacked, I don't know, by a plague of aphids, say, or by some plant pathogens, um, that plant that plant that's being attacked will make its defense uh, chemicals in, in the plant which it sends around its own body to start with, to, to tell other parts of that plant to, um, to be prepared effectively for the attack and, and, and the defense chemicals are being made. But the, the messages that are sent around that plant can actually be transferred along the, the mycorrhizal network to another plant. So a, a, a plant nearby could be uh, told to, to prepare itself for an imminent attack. Also, we should say that, that, that um, chemicals pa pass through the air from one plant to another in, in, in a similar way. But certainly there's all sorts of movements going along uh, below ground. This is also true of the decomposers. So on the forest floor, if you know things like Megacalibia platyphylla, you get these vast networks, armillarias, vast networks, Hyphaloma fasciculari, the sulfur fungus also makes these networks which um, join up uh, little bits of twigs and leaves and beech cupules and big bits of wood as well. And we know that nutrients shift between those. We've done work on, on that, uh, quite a lot of work on that ourselves. So, so that there are super highways on the forest floor or within the forest floor where all sorts of things are being shifted from place to place. Hope that answers that one. Fantastic. We've got a question here from Stuart who asks, what are the effects of simulating nitrogen deposition on fungal league tables? Are there new leaders? Ah, okay, that's a good one. So I don't know the answer to that for decomposer fungi, for rotters, because we haven't, and I'm not sure that anybody else has actually done that. However, we know that I'll, I'll, the minute we stop, I'll probably think, oh, yes, we did that work in such and such time. But, but I can certainly answer that for, for mycorrhizal fungi. And we, we know that mycorrhizal relationships change dramatically um, with nitrogen deposition. So that's not necessarily the battles between the fungi, but certainly the relationships between the mycorrhizal fungi and, um, the, and the trees. So there is a tendency, well, we've known since the 1980s uh, about this problem with nitrogen deposition. It was first noticed in the Netherlands um, where certain groups of fungi were becoming rarer and rarer. So for example, the stipitate hydnoids and things like that become, became quite rare and attributed to nitrogen 
uh, deposition. So there are lots of fungi which uh, plants seem not to associate with un under high nitrogen inputs by due to man. Um, but equally well, there are some fungi which do better. Now it turns out that the ones which seem to do better um, when there's lots of nitrogen are the, 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 fung the mycorrhizal fungi which don't produce very large networks and don't really grow out very much at all. Maybe it's relatively inexpensive for a plant to have those associated with them, but those fungi which do normally form big networks and forage extensively to find nitrogen and phosphorus and things like that seem not to do so well. So, so, so there are there are certainly big there are certainly big differences. Hope that goes some way to answering that question. Um, so we, we've got we've got an interesting one here. Phil, we've got from a uh, from Lenka who says it seems to me from the foragers perspective that there are more mushrooms growing in Eastern Europe than in the UK. Is that true? And if so, do you know why? Well. Um... Okay, so yeah, I, I think as far as fruit bodies are concerned, I certainly get the gut feeling that in in the UK, um, our, our our forests are, seem to be far less pr prolific than some of the other places that I visited. Um, I can remember uh, six years ago now, I, I worked at um, the University of Berkeley in California for four months and at about this time of year, or November maybe it was, I went up to, the, to North California to a place called Mendocino um, on, on, on a fungus foray with one of the classes. And I was just amazed that in about five minutes, I, I saw more fruit bodies on the forest floor than I would see probably in the whole of, a, of an autumn fruiting season in Britain. So yes, I, I think that that is true. And, and so I think that and, I, and, it, and this worried me. The other thing that worried me in North America was the fact that their fruit bodies are huge. So you'll, you'll see a Belitis edulis and it'll be this tall. You'll see an Ammonita muscaria and it'll be goodness knows how, how tall, they're much, much bigger. So I think, I think some of the reasons are that our woodlands, are, I think are probably really quite depauperate of nutrients compared to, to systems elsewhere. If you think what we've done in Britain over the last few thousand years, we've effectively pillaged our woodlands continuously. We're continually taking wood, wood away. That's um, not just uh, as forestry operations, but um, but just just ordinary people just just to live have taken wood for firewood. If you look on our woodlands, we we don't have very much wood on the forest floor. That is not a natural situation at all. Um, we keep taking, 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 and of course that means you're taking nutrients away that are not necessarily being replenished. So I think that that might be one, uh, one reason, certainly. And of course, we, ha we have, we're a small island. Um, and although it looks very well treed when you drive around on the motorways, it, it really isn't particularly forested. It's just that we have lots of trees along the edge of edges of our roads and things, which is nice. So I think that that's, I think that's one issue. I think it's an important issue as, as well from the point of view of foraging. Um, it worries me very much that some expensive restaurants um, have on their menus wild fungi and um, they want to buy them from somewhere. And so some people go out indiscriminately um, raking up all, all of the fruit bodies that are there and damaging the, the forest floor as well and, and just taking everything. I think we have to be very careful. I, I have no objections to, to taking um, few fungi perhaps for your own use or an odd one uh, for scientific purposes but I think we have to be very very careful not to uh, pillage the, the the relatively small amounts of fruit bodies that we get in Britain um, that's a personal perspective I, I guess so I'm not sure if that really answered the question but 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 I but I agree that we do seem to have relatively relatively fewer fruit bodies and I think it's because of things that we've done to our forests in the past, probably. And that's, uh, I think that, that's, that's a wonderful answer. I'm aware we are now slowly creeping over time. Um, and there, there's, there's so many questions to get through. Um, perhaps it might be worthwhile. This is the last event.
event of UK Fungus Day 2020. We've had, um, I think, about five days of events online. Um, and for those who don't know, Lynn was the founder of UK Fungus Day uh, back when it was just a, a mere Wales Fungus Day, it's, and it's grown since. So I suppose as maybe a final statement and to, to close us off, have you got any thoughts and comments on UK Fungus Day and what, what you feel to, however well, you'd like to end? Right, I, I think you're perhaps giving me a little too much credit in, in saying that, that I was the founder. I was certainly the person who pushed for first Wales Fungus Day and then UK Fungus Day, but um, I, I know the huge amount of work that it, that, that, that it is to get every Fungus Day off the ground. Um, and every fungus day has been been driven by somebody else and, 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 and never by me. Um, but I, I do hope that I had a, at least a small part to play in getting things going. I, I think that everybody's doing wonderfully. Um, I would like to see it bigger. I, I would like to see not just UK fungus day, but world fungus day. And that is something that I've tried to push for in several places, but with not much um, success yet. Um, I think that you've all done fantastically uh, getting this virtual fungus day together this year and hopefully next year we'll be able to perhaps um, go back to our more normal sorts of things but in saying that I think this has been so successful I, I really would like to see very much more occurring online because we can reach very many more people I know that in, in these sessions we've had this year we've only had reached out for to 100 people but you can imagine that we can very easily reach out to a thousand people um, on various platforms like Zoom and, and other things. And so we could reach out um, world, worldwide. Um, I, it, since, since we first locked down in March, I've attended quite a lot and spoken at a lot of conferences worldwide. So it's made the world in lots of ways a smaller place. And I think it's given us very many more opportunities. So I hope very much that uh, Fungus Day continues and grows from strength to strength. We can use um, my, my favorite motto, Excelsior, uh, which mean, means, means higher or better or further or, or, what, or whatever, onwards and upwards effectively. So thank you all very much uh, for the huge amounts of work you've done. Thank you very much for everybody who's, who's participated and come to listen or, 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 sp or speak or join in at, at any of these events. And um, I, I wish all of you huge success for the future and let's go on to bigger and better things. Thank you very much indeed for all, all of the efforts that people have made um, since we first started doing these things in, I can't remember when it was, 2011 in Wales, I think in 2000, perhaps in 12, it, it, in, it more widely in the UK. Thank you all.